Canon, and I'll be reading the scripture this morning. If you're able, I'd like you to stand uh, to honor the reading of God's word. Scripture this morning is from Genesis chapter 41, verses 14 through 24. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh sent to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all of the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ones. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right. Amen. Thank you, Ming. Thank you, Dave. All right. Uh, well, good morning. We're going to get into this cows. What, what was all that about? Um, like I said, thank you, Howie. Uh, actually, just to follow up on something Ming said, with CG's uh, community group started last week, it was the Candlethill's spirited discussion out there. Um, they meet every other week. Today is... Am I doing something? Oh, okay. <laughs> Today, um, ours, um, the one that Ann and I lead at our house, that'll be kicking off today. Um, so looking forward to it. If you guys are not part of a community group, you're more than welcome to check ours out today. Uh, come get the address from me right afterwards. I will say this. Um, we really desperately need and would like uh, community groups to surface in one in the Brunswicks, so north or new, uh, or and new, whatever, um, and then in the Highland Park kind of Metuchen area down there as well. Uh, possibly one towards Hillsborough, but uh, don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but um, we do have needs for community groups. The reason why is because we don't want to see them as uh, a program in our church, like, oh, we need to find a way to make sure we stay in them in as we grow and all of that. All that's true, but we really want to see CGs as uh, PCC scattered and gathered. So in other words, we want to see CGs as core to our church. Even this Sunday morning gathering that we're having, uh, we would love for it to be viewed as a gathering of our CGs. Um, so like I said, if you check ours out today, the Candidates next Sunday, uh, the Pirellos on Wednesday, whichever one of those works for you. Uh, but we also have that need to be able to see some other ones emerge. So uh, just kind of tag that. Um, keep that at the forefront if you're interested in hosting, leading, what have you. Um, but seasons. I um, want to talk about a season. We're stepping into a new season here, um, fall, but we're also in a particular season of our church where we are um, wanting to be really clear on what it means for us to be uh, PCC, Point Community Church. And so uh, we're calling this series PCC uh, period, uh, and by that, um, just trying to simplify and strip down uh, what it means for us to be a church. What does it mean for us to align and share a vision, a mission, uh, and core virtues as a community? And last week, uh, we talked about, we talked about, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, three, two, one, I think it's hooked. Is it not? I thought it was in. Uh, last week we talked about what it means to step into the first part of our vision. And I'm going to put the vision statement on the screen in a bit. Uh, but last week it was about uh, just cultivating this idea of vision, right? And so anyone can say like, ooh, ah, that's a nice house, that's wonderful. Uh, but it takes a special skill to be able to say, yes, but I can see that when I look at that. 
Um, and that's what we really need to cultivate amongst ourselves. Um, I don't think that's just something that certain people have. I think that's something that we all, it's a skill we can all develop, where we look at this, and I don't mean, this is a metaphor, I'm an English teacher, right? So um, that could be a person's life, that could be the life of a neighborhood, that could be an institution, that could be a location, uh, but you might see all the brokenness there and you might stop there, but what we actually need are people who can see this and then see this as a possibility and then move towards it. Um, and last week when we laid out the beginnings of our vision statement, nope, we laid out the beginning of our vision statement, we said that we really care about our region considering us a vital partner by virtue of our responsive citizenship. So last week it was about what does it mean for us to be good citizens, responsive citizens, and specifically citizens in a foreign place, a place that feels hostile or at least unfamiliar, maybe welcome. And the hard call from Jeremiah last week, or really the Lord through Jeremiah was, hey Israel, we understand this place feels very, very foreign to you, unwelcome, maybe even oppositional to you, but in contrast to the false prophetic voices that are saying, your freedom and liberation lies in getting out of here, um, the true voice of God is actually, nope, um, I have a different message, maybe a harder message. It's to actually build here, uh, to multiply here, um, and with a, a vision of, it says, uh, seek the good of the city, seek the welfare of the city, seek the shalom of the city. In other words, I want you to, to seek to rebuild Eden here um, in exile. I want you to make Babylon, become Babylonian citizens so that you care about Babylon enough for exile to look like Eden. And that's a hard call, but that was last week, is, is call up beauty from brokenness as citizens. This week, it's a little different. This week, we are going to focus on that second part. And by the way, if you see stuff in this vision statement, you're like, mm, we're missing something, um, but bring that to me because this is, this is not uh, cast in, in, in tablets of stone right now. So this can be a living vision for us and it really should be. In fact, there's a ship that I think we're leaving out that I might want to add to this. So just kind of know that this is something that you can also and we should also contribute to. But this week we want to be focused on what does it mean for us to be responsive leaders? And uh, leaders is something, leadership is something that is probably front and center in our culture right now. Uh, you're probably hearing from various kinds of leaders, some of whom you uh, esteem, some of whom you abhor. Um, and what does it really mean to be a leader? And specifically, what does it mean to be a visionary leader? Um, Marvin and I have had some conversations about this over, you know, Shake Shack. Um, and hey, you know, can leaders be born or are they made? Can they be made or do they just kind of have it, whatever that it is? And I think that in some ways we have kind of fixed definitions of what it means to lead. And we might think visionary leaders are uh, the Steve Jobs type or the Elon Musk type or, you know, some sort of influencer that you follow, right? That those, are, those are the leaders uh, of our culture. But I think that scripture today, through the story of Joseph, uh, will give us a different perspective on what it means to, be, uh, to have vision as a leader. Uh, specifically today, I think Genesis 41 will get us to see that part of vision is that we will cultivate a kind of leadership that sees gain, both out of past loss, but for future stakes. And so today... Uh, I think visionary leadership is going to be what it means for us to uh, see and in some ways call out gain from past loss, but for future stakes and see what the Lord has for us. Let's go to him before we go to his word. Pray with me. Father, um, you're, you're the, the ultimate uh, visionary leader par excellence and it doesn't you know, it, it doesn't mean you're corporate. It doesn't mean you're secular. Uh, I think vision um, began with you where you started in a garden and you saw a garden city. Um, and so allow us to adopt your visionary mind, your visionary heart, your visionary spirit uh, so that we might see your leading and guiding of us as a people through today's passage. 
Uh, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. We are in Genesis 41, uh, starting in vor- verse 14. And I want to just ask a question at the, at the outset. Well, what does it mean for us to, I said, leadership sees gain out of past loss? Um, I think that that's a question I want to kind of start with. What does it even mean for us to see gain uh, from loss? Well, let's look at verse 14. It says, uh, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. All right? And just, if you guys aren't familiar with the Bible, in some ways you may have heard the name Joseph. Joseph, the, uh, the kind of, let's call him the father of Jesus. That's not this Joseph. That's Joseph in the New Testament. This is Joseph in many ways, um, who is part of the early history of, of Israel, all right? So if you've ever heard of Joseph Technicolor Dreamcoat, that's this Joseph, all right? Probably a little more than just the Technicolor dream coat, but uh, that's this Joseph. By the way, if you've never, ever watched the animated film, Joseph, King of Dreams, I actually highly recommend that. I actually have watched that. Was thinking of watching that once again just to prep for today, but commend that to you. I think it's better than the Exodus one, the Moses one. Um, anyway, that's who this Joseph is, not the father of Jesus, um, but Joseph in the Old Testament part of Israel's story. Now, we typically associate Joseph with dreams. Uh, In fact, I think the animated film is even called Joseph, King of Dreams. Um, And I think that's fine as far as it goes, but I think if we just see Joseph, King of Dreams, and then this sermon becomes about like, hey, God had given you dreams, and you know, follow your dreams, and don't let anyone take your dreams for you, I think it misses a lot of what forms and in some ways reimagines his dreams because Joseph is not just a story about dreams, it is a story about pits. And it's not just here in verse 14. Pits have been part of the Joseph setting throughout his story. He was, he was his brothers, his jealous brothers, right? Joseph was this young guy that's like, hey, big brothers, I have a dream and the dream is that you got, I think like, you guys are supposed to bow down and serve me. I think that's the dream, right? And they're like, we, we hate your dream and now we hate you, <laughs> right? Um, it actually says that in the Bible, like we hate your dream and now we hate you. Um, and so that's, and th- what do they do? They decide they want to throw him in a pit. And they throw him in a pit and he's brought out of the pit by a bunch of traveling Midianites and then sold to uh, some Ishmaelites, distant relatives of Israelites. Um, And then again, eventually, Joseph finds favor in a certain place, um, but then things turn bad, and he winds up um, in the in the pit, thrown in the pit by a man named Potiphar. Right? So so pits uh, are every bit as part of the Joseph story, maybe even more so than his dreams. And what is it about us that tends to narrate his story as dreams, not pits. Um, and, I, and I want us to think about what, why we do that, not only with his story, but why we do that in general. And I could think of a few reasons, right? As we even think about, if you can let your mind, I'm not like an EMDR therapist, but if you can let your mind kind of step, take one foot into the world uh, and imagine one of the pits that you have been in. Right? It may be not hard for some of us to imagine that. It may not be 40 years ago, 30 years ago, or 20 or 10. It may be like a couple minutes ago. It may be this season. And I could see why we would want to escape the pits. Right? Some of us might escape the pits because we do a level of comparison. Right? Their pit seems deeper than my pit. So why am I bothered by my pit so much? My pit's not a pit, it's a divot. It's a pothole. Theirs is the pit, right? Um, I understand that. And there's probably a certain amount of that that is a mark of like resilience and maturity, a certain amount of that. But I think some of us may do like an all or nothing thing, which is like, well, you know, I'm not being whatever, insert the most egregious pit you can think of. I'm not in that pit, so therefore I must not be in a pit. So maybe that's one reason we avoid pits, is we just think we don't have one because we look at someone around us who has it worse. 
But I think there's a second reason, and this one probably makes just as much sense, which is just like pain reduction. Like if you're in a pit, it doesn't look that nice around you. And it seems like a place where I don't want to dress up this pit. I'm not looking to buy furniture for the pit. I'm not looking for curtains and way to like make the pit look less pity. I actually just want what? I want out. I want out. I want up. I want out. I want to flee. And so in some ways, that's why I think we might kind of shun and shy away from pits. I think there's also um, something that's a little bit deeper. And I think it has to do a little bit with how we see God. And I don't know about you, but I've heard this from my heart and even come out of my lips. Why is God the one who kills dreams but lets the memories of pits last? Right? I could see Joseph asking that. Uh, I could see Joseph, and there is actually even a, like a poignant part of that animated film. I really commend the animated film to you guys in case you can't tell. I'm referencing it more than the text. Um, <laughs> but, but even in the text, I think that there is this sense in which uh, when he's in his pits, the various pits, pit one, pit two, and pit three, the pit of prison, where he, you reach this moment in your life when you're like, why are you the kind of God that kills the dreams but you allow the lingering pain of the loss remain? So maybe you compare and therefore minimize your pit. Maybe you just want to walk away from it because it's so dang painful and maybe you just don't want to face the fact that God is such a God that says, this dies, but this is going to live still. And the thing that lives doesn't feel so great. I think, I think that exilic experience, whether it was the one that Israel experienced in Babylon or the one that Joseph experiences, right? Joseph is a case study of exile. I think sometimes we can see that exilic pit as opposition, right? And it is. It feels very oppositional. But I think if we just see it that full stop period, I think we miss out on how it is also educational, right? How the pit educates, how it prepares, right? And, and if you're bold enough, and this is an if, if you're bold enough and you have enough support around you and you're willing to take their support, that's another qualification. Sometimes we do have support around us, but we're not willing to take it. If you're willing to take it, that, that pit, that exilic experience is not only does it educate, not only does it prepare, it might improve and it might advance you if you're willing for that category to be valid. Right? Because pits, they, 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 they take away something for sure. You can easily calculate loss from pits. But they also give something. Right? And I don't want I wouldn't say this willy-nilly to a person who's just in the middle of their pit. I wouldn't be like, hey, day one, you're in the pit. Day two, what are you getting from your pit? Like, I wouldn't do that. But that's glib. That's unkind, maybe even ungodly, maybe even wicked. But I do think there's a place over a period of time where if you have the right supports around you to be able to ask the question reflectively, what is, it, what is this pit doing? Where are we supposed to come out of this? And let me just share a little bit just personally here because I'm not saying this uh, theoretically. Pits do provide um, skills, insights, and character change. Um, I will tell people this. I am not, I am slower than I used to be, dumber than I used to be, more tired than I used to be, um, than I was when I had my last experience of the pit uh, circa 2015 to 17, maybe even a little earlier than that, maybe a little bit later than that too. I'm all of those things. I'm dumber, dumber and slower, just more tired, but I do think I'm better. Despite all of that, despite everything I've lost, I do think in some sense the Lord has found a way to make me a little better though. Because here's one of the things he's shown me in the pit. Um, I'll say this, that I had what I would call, and I wouldn't have known it at the time, 
I may have known it, but not willing to face it. I had what I would call, and I said this to somebody this week, I had an, an adulterous ambition, which means I cheated on my wife with my ambition. And, and I overlooked, I hop, skipped, and jumped over my family because of my ambition. Right? That is not something I would have been able to say before the pit. I don't even think I was ready to say it during it. But at some point, especially not early on, at some point I came to that realization with help from brothers and sisters who showed me that this thing, even this thing that I felt like I was doing for the Lord was tearing apart something that was given to me by the Lord. So certain insights and character come out of the pit. Um, and then someone else, this, this uh, woman who I revere, she lives in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was actually a member of the first um, graduating class from Central High School. If you guys know anything about Central High School. Um, first high school to be desegregated. So uh, this woman um, said to me, you know what your problem is? And I was like, several. <laughs> um, but she said, you and your experience during that season was you trying to be a shooting star rather than a shining one, right? So a shooting star, it goes across the sky, and it's like, ooh, and ah, and, and people might travel hundreds of miles to see, like the eclipse a couple of months ago. It's like, we will travel to see this, this thing happen. And she said, you know, this ministry that you were a part of, that change that should have taken part in 10 years, it took like a little more than two. And that might be cool to like, ooh, and ah, in a moment, but... That is unsustainable, and it's going to actually hurt you and others around you, which is exactly what happened. And so the shining star, no one really notices it, especially if you've got enough light pollution around you, you don't even know it's there. But uh, the shining star is just kind of there, and it'll be there for a while. And it'll be there for a while, and it'll be there for a while, and there won't be as many oohs and ahs, but it's actually far more healthy. Both of those insights, the adulterous ambition and the the need to be a shining star rather than a shooting one, I would not have been, it not have been given to me if it didn't happen because of the pit. And so, yes, it took away certain things that I wish it hadn't taken away. People and dreams that I had, like legit dreams that I had, things that I, I left one area of dream in my life to go into another area of dream in my life, and both stopped. But I gained something. The Lord gave me something out of that. He also gave this last thing, which uh, life looks different from below. Right? So if you've, if you've been used to a certain amount of gain in your life, like you're ahead and it feels like you, know, you are knocking the cover off the ball, right? Um, you just can't miss. Right? You have the Midas touch in life. You can develop a certain perspective from that place. And then the pit is a completely different place. And it's a completely different perspective. But it is the place from which new vision emerges. And it's maybe the vision that God was actually leading you to all along. So how does that new vision emerge? Let's look at verse 15. Where Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have a dream. There's no one who can interpret it, right? There's a dream and there's no one that can interpret it, right? There's a need, right? I hope we pay attention to the, to the needs around us. Something about being in the pit when, you have, when you've been forced into that place, it makes you aware of need, probably because you, you become aware of your own need for the first time in your life or maybe for, in a fresh way, you're aware of needs. And so you're looking and you're more aware. That's why I think... Seasons of loss, for those who aren't more like naturally empathetic, like my wife is more naturally empathetic than, than I am, shocker to many of you, but, but um, I do think when you experience seasons of loss, you tend to be more empathetic because you, you realize what it means to lose, and so you have your head on a swivel more for that. So needs emerge. Other people's needs emerge. You're more aware of them. But I want to ask the question... Um, first, right, this word responsive leadership. I would, I would argue that the gain that comes out of our past loss 
is going to be for future stakes with a qualification. It's the qualification of last week that we're first, not just responsive leaders, but that we are responsive and responsible citizens. Um, why Joseph, right? Why, why is Joseph chosen for this? Why is Joseph chosen as the interpreter here? And I, and I think it's fine to be able to say, well, he's gifted for it, right? Like Joseph knows dreams. He knows how to interpret dreams. Maybe. But just because he can do something doesn't mean he should do that thing. Because there's something else that Joseph actually does and, and, and has been that probably qualifies him just as much to interpret this dream. Joseph has been part of the households of Egypt for quite some time. If you were to um, look at verses 17 to 24, where Pharaoh has this dream of these cows, and you know these cows that are full and fat and ready for, it's hunting season right now, and I know some of you hunters, this lands, but a cow that has been prepared to be enjoyed, and then there's these very, very lean cows, right? Um, Joseph, yes, has the gifts to be able to interpret those dreams, as he does, but he's also earned the right to be able to do that. Because another word that is just traveling through the story of Joseph is not just pit, but it's household. Joseph has been uh, a member of the household of Potiphar's family. He's been a member of the household of Pharaoh. In other words, Joseph has spent time. Uh, Joseph has earned the right to, to, to meet and address these needs. Right? And so if we're going to become responsive leaders, there's a reason why it's second in this. Because the citizenship should come first. The time spent to, to earn the right to lead. And so Joseph has that, and he's, and he's not only been uh, there, and he's, and he's now trusted, um, but he's also been listening and looking for needs all along. By the way, I hope that we're a church that is always listening and looking for needs. Right? And I know that we've said in many ways that you know, our home base is Franklin, Franklin Township, Somerset. But if you're not in Somerset, if you're in Hillsboro, if you're in the Brunswicks, if you're in Highland Park, I also pray that you guys would let us know what needs uh, you're hearing and seeing there because we need to be able to meet those as well. I do think we're called to concentric circles of influence as Point Community Church. And, you, and, and the reason I say that too is because you live there. You're involved there, right? We have people on the Board of Education there. We have people who have deep relationships with their neighbors there. And so uh, the place where you've been, the place where you have been good citizens, look for needs there so that you might respond to them, not just because you're gifted, but because you're trusted and you're engaged and you're immersed there as well. Joseph has been all of those things. And there are needs that abound and, and surround us, whether they're in our towns, whether they're in our campuses, our workplaces, our homes. And sometimes we, we see ourselves in those positions, but I think what, what the Joseph story is getting us to look at is not only do we see ourselves in those positions, but do we see ourselves as positioned in those places? Does, does, has God positioned us in those places for a particular purpose? We're going to see what the purpose is in a couple minutes. But notice what Joseph says. Joseph says uh, in verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, because Pharaoh's like, hey, you're the dream guy. And Joseph says, hey, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. God will really interpret the dream. I'll tell you why that's significant. Because um, I read that and I think, man, what a, first time I read it, I was like, what a, I, that's, that's the kind of like Christianese and false humility that I have a really hard time with. Like, I am noticing this gift and this, this attribute in you, which I full well know comes from God. And when I say, man, that was such a blessing, and it's not me, it's him. There used to be this song that used to drive me nuts. Like, don't look at me when you're looking for perfection. I will only let you down, something, something, something. And it's like, I know you'll let me down. I'm not saying you're the end all, be all, full stop. So, so when I see Joseph say, hey, it's not in me, God will give. There's a part of me that's just like, wants to hold my nose. Until you read the Joseph story. 
Because when you read the Joseph story, and you've got to see who he's talking to. He's talking to Pharaoh right now. And who is Pharaoh? Pharaoh is someone who sees himself as the embodiment of uh, Ra, uh, of the Egyptian god. Like not the image, not just the image and the way we think of it in, in, uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Like we're reflecting God, and it's a real reflection. He's like, no, I am God on earth. And so Joseph is speaking in some sense to Pharaoh, but he's also speaking to himself because if you know anything about the Joseph story, whenever he's talked about dreams before, you know who's been missing? He's never once referenced God. If you look at his dreams, starting from his teenage dreams, it's always been, I've dreamt, I've dreamt, I've dreamt. My dream, my dream, my dream. God is absent from his narrating of his dreams. This is the first time that Joseph ever links any of his dreams or his gifts to God. And it's one of those things that I think, again, the pit brought about. I don't think Joseph would have gotten there if it hadn't been for the pit. I think he would have been like, that's what I do. I'm the dreamer. I'm the dream giver. Period. The end. And there's something about the pit. There's something about who he's talking to, and then there's something about where he's talking from that I think enables him to say, this belongs to God. For us, I want us to, to, to look around for a second. Just if you can, I don't, you know, I don't want to be one of those people. I know you guys are these people. If I tell you to look around, you're like, I'm not looking around. You're going to tell me what to do. Um, but if you could, if you look around this church and you'd think about the gifts and the expertise and the experiences that are even in this room, if you consider not only the different backgrounds and identities, but the skills, the places people have been. Right? There are people here who have planted churches for the last 30 years. There are people who have been on battlefields, literal battlefields. I'm not using that metaphorically. Like the battlefield in which the Jets will pay the Patriots. No, that, not that. <laughs> literal battlefields. Artists. Um, educators, resourceful people, entrepreneurs, all of that are in this room. People who deal with, with uh, human emotions, the human body, that require a level of precision, analysis, care, compassion, all of those things are in this room. So I might say like, you know, look around at what's here, but then I would say to all of those people that encompass all of those skills and experiences and expertise, and maybe even those I didn't mention, I would say, don't just look around. I would say, look within. And I don't mean look within in some sort of self-helpy, new agey kind of way. I mean, look within what God has deposited in you. It is not for us to hoard. Right? Your education, uh, whatever experience, whatever training you have, whatever you've picked up in life through your various travels, pit or no pit, whatever's come out of them, whatever you've gained, it is not for us to hoard. By God, it's for us to lead with. It's for us to lead with. Humble, visionary leadership arises for past loss, from past loss, present realities that are among us, and also for future stakes. So what are the stakes? What are the stakes? Let's look at the stakes. The stakes are verses 25 to 32, where Joseph diagnoses um, Pharaoh's dream. He interprets it. And he's like, hey, listen, these fat cows, uh, they're going to be a, a bunch of years where Egypt is going to be full they're going to have everything they need and then some. And then the lean cows, it's going to be an era where the land is in famine. So you're going to have feast and you're going to have famine. And we look at that as Joseph's skill, right? We look at that as his contribution, his visionary leadership. But I actually think there's something more where he leads. And I think it's actually something that's maybe a little scarier, which is verses 33 through 36, where he says... Right After giving Pharaoh the interpretation that Pharaoh, this dream, it's describing your kingdom's future, both the feast and the famine, 
He's saying, let Pharaoh select a discerning wise man. And then let Pharaoh set him over things. And then appoint. And then take one-fifth of the grain. And then let them gather all the grain. Then let's keep it here. It, it, it's, it's, this may be the hardest part for us. It's like, okay, it's hard for you to be, be like, what did I get? It's hard to be in the pit. And then it's, then it's hard to say, I've gained something from the pit. And then it's hard to maybe even see the needs around us. And then this might be the hardest step, because if you've done all of that, then to be able to say, my recommendation matters. Getting to the place where you say, okay, I know how to fix this. Or I, I, I can speak into this. And that might be a difficult place for us to get to. Why? Because we think, man, what a level of hubris that must involve for, for me, little old me, who's been in prison, who's been in the pit, or who's been an outsider, to be brought in and then to say, I got your answer. And yet, remember, God has been positioning them for places, maybe for such a time as this. And so maybe you've been welcomed into places in your community. Right? Maybe you've been welcomed, put in certain places in your campus. And maybe you see that you have things to offer and you just happen to be in this position, whether you're leading on campus or whether you're leading in your town, and you might just think, I'm there. And yeah, you might be there and be there and be trusted there and be a good citizen there and support what's happening there, but also see that maybe you might be there to bring about solutions to meet some of the stakes that are there. In other words, what might happen if you don't? What happens to Egypt if Joseph doesn't step forward and speak up? This may be the hardest part for us, is to believe that we're actually positioned in a place and not just there to be there, but there to be able to address the stakes and meet the needs that nobody else is able to meet. I've got further questions from there. I've got questions like, where does Joseph's story end? Where does God's vision carry him? But I want to pause to give you guys some space to ask a couple of questions as well before I lead us to the table. So Marv's got the mic. Um, ask away. Pastor Mark. Um, I noticed in this passage that uh, Egypt, of course, in the Bible is the, the metaphor for sin and evil and yeah. badness. And yet God gives Joseph a method to save them from judgment. Mm -hmm. I feel sometimes I want to expedite judgment. How, do, how does it fit that we are called to use our insights and our gifts to be a blessing mm -hmm. to people who aren't necessarily good? Mm. There's a book of the Bible that should be emerging in your mind, right? Like you could think of this. What would you say, Trish? Romans is there, yep. Jonah's there, clearly. Jeremiah 29, which is where we were last week, right? Seek the good of the city. What city? Babylon. Who's Babylon? They're the people that dragged us away here, enslaved us. Um, how would you guys respond to Pastor Mark? Right? What's it like for us to seek the good of people who are clearly evil? Anyone have a response? Glory in. Yeah, um, amen, let's go to the table, right? Like, it's, it's uh, in, your, in their shalom, you'll find your shalom, right? In their healing from brokenness, you'll find yours. I think there's such a propensity, especially 
for uh, those who follow Christ, and especially if you've been someone who is led in the Christian community, um, to be about the work of God out there, and you have forgotten about that, like the thing that launched you into that work, which was the gospel. It's one of those reasons why Paul goes out of his way to repeat his story to himself all over and over. Like he talks about his pit. Like I used to be this guy who did this, did this, did this, and then I got knocked off a horse. And then he tells, goes to another place and he tells that story to himself again and again and again. Uh, I think we have to remember um, the fact that calling out beauty from brokenness, calling out like uh, resurrection from death is not just like the missionary call, it's the gospel call as well. Those are the same things. Um, someone once said to me very basically is like Jesus did not come to make good people better. Um, he came to make dead people alive. Um, and so in some ways, whether it's Babylon last week, Egypt this week, or the various expressions of Babylon and Egypt that you find yourself in, uh, the Jesus, the cross-shaped way is not to escape and pull the eject button. Um, it's to stay uh, and seek the good of those places. But, no, go ahead. No, no just some thoughts on that. that yeah. Um, in my experience, you, so part of our role, I think, in some of this is, is to be able to identify the brokenness and to be able to call it out. Yeah. And, and I don't think we will be, and from my experience, I have found that we are oftentimes not effective in that, in that message unless we have previously engaged. And, and sometimes that previous engagement can be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but, but it can be mandatory work to be able to give credibility. So when you make that call, it can be listened to. I, I think of just a conversation I had yesterday. I was, I was driving in a car with a friend and we were discussing a situation with uh, their child and you know, they're like, well, you know, the traditional response would be, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, and I think most people in modern society would say, yeah, that was a little bit toxic. And so then there's this reaction that, you know, just laissez-faire, just, just leave it be. And, um, you know, it was a good conversation to be able to say, you know, yeah, that, that, that traditional response, yeah, we, that's probably not going to help. And, but also leaving it alone isn't going to help. So what's, what's that third way? What, what's, what's the thing that yep. we're missing? And be able to, hey, we had a good conversation of, of what does that look like mm -hmm. for, for, you know, this you know, situation with their child. But, um, but we, we, I would have never been in that situation if I, if I hadn't been in the car with him. Right. You know, it, it, took, it took some of that work first. Yeah, I, I think... Part of my response to this, I want to hold off for the next two weeks where we look at our mission, not our vision, but our mission, uh, which is to identify with Christ and the people groups of our region. Um, and what does it mean to really identify with Christ and the people groups of our region? Because many of us, and I'm not all for tearing down tradition. I think certain parts of tradition are really, really helpful. Um, but I am for building on helpful foundations and building up and tearing down as we need to. Um, I think part of what I would probably call us away from is a, a prior approach to sharing Christ, which was, um, and some people may be called to this, who knows, but I don't think it's the call writ large where it's like, hey, I don't know who you are. I see you eating in this food court in this mall. I'm going to throw down this plastic thing. It's called a tract. It's got flames on it, and I want us to have a conversation about Jesus. Um, I, I think that that is straying away from at least the vision that we see in Jeremiah, that we see here in um, Genesis 41, and I think in some ways the Jesus call as well. Again, I don't want to throw, that, that's not all bath water. Um, there may be some baby there, but I do think for the most part, being, being trusted citizens is necessary to be trusted leaders. Um, someone take the mic, Vanita. <laughs> this is a death trap, by the way. <laughs> <clears throat> um, to respond to Pastor Mark's question, um, I know you know Pro Tim. Um, well, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, and I have two children with him. You see Chris and Mia. And um, <clears throat> this has been a question that I have been asking myself, like how can 
I pray for him who I've seen as my enemy mm. um, now for the entire time that he was with me. I didn't realize what was happening. So um, I've learned so much in being what I call my pit too, uh, mm -hmm. the dark days. And tomorrow is my daughter. So we, we, I officially was able to kick him out when she was three months old. Mm. And she's turning 10 tomorrow. Wow. And it also marks my 10th anniversary of just survivorship. And mm -hmm. when I look back at wh what situation I was in 10 years ago and where I am now, um, God is, is truly amazing. Yeah. And I'm in awe of his love and responsiveness to me and my situation. Yeah. And so um, just this week, uh, so he did just get remarried. Mm -hmm. um, every girlfriend he had, I prayed for because... I was really hoping they wouldn't suffer the way I did. And now he's married. He's expecting a child mm. uh, pretty much any time now with her. And she has two children from, from the first marriage. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of praying. And I just found myself praying two days ago, just thinking about the situation and the fact that the kids are still suffering from his abusive behavior, but uh, the system is not designed to protect uh, People in our situation, unless you have bruises or you're bleeding or you've had threats to your life, it doesn't count. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm leaning on God even harder now because uh, I'm really learning how he wants to transform not just me, mm -hmm. um, but Vikram and the kids and you know what he's calling us to this has been 10 years mm -hmm. and how he's worked on me in the past 10 years is just significant and um, probably would have <laughs> needed it to get me straight out to where I am where I can see red flags and now I can pass this down mm. you know generation to generation but yeah I did you know pray for him yeah. I prayed for him. I, I genuinely mm -hmm. want this marriage to work. I want him to learn you know, that this yep. is a blessing, that a wife is a blessing, a child is a blessing. And now, in one way, God has given him a whole new opportunity to do this. Yeah. I think that that's required 10 years of reflection for. And I like the fact that you were saying situation, 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 because I think it's important to be able to say that is descriptive of your situation after these 10 years because I think if someone would have said that to you in year one you would have probably like you know put a hit out on them um, but, and, and probably rightfully so but I, by uh, the person who said that to you not your your ex but um, yeah so 10 years it's taken that long to get to this place right um, and so situations and context oh. do matter let me take this to the table um, and I'm going to take it to the table by inviting you guys up to not only share in how the ultimate expression of this, as Glorianne said, is um, the gospel and probably the climactic moments in the gospel, but I'm going to invite you to complete a thought. I want you to finish the passage that in some ways ends the Joseph story. Uh, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Okay? Finish that passage because I think that's where a lot of us stop you meant it for evil against me God meant it for good but that's not where the passage ends the passage ends with to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today and I think if we miss that we miss the scope of what God was doing all along. And if we miss that, we miss the radical nature of God's grace. Because we could look at it as, well, this was all meant for Joseph. And it wasn't really all meant for Joseph. It never was. The dreams God gave him, the pit that he eventually ended up in, and then the new dreams and the new abilities and the new positions that God gave him were never about Joseph. They were always about Many people should be kept alive as they are today in Egypt. And in many ways, against seven years of famine in Egypt, the whole idea was, verse 36, so that Egypt may not perish through famine. Right? That's why our vision 
has this first part in it, that our region will consider us. Right? I've gotten the question, is why does our vision rely on someone else's impression of us? That's why. Because ultimately, these are the stakes, and the ultimate stakeholder, the ultimate stakeholder is God. But under God, the ultimate stakeholder is not Point Community Church. It's the people in the region that we are called to and sent into that are the stakeholders. That's what our pits have been for. That's what the dreams, the skills, that's what our vision, that's what our leadership is for. So as we come to the table, I want us to think about the gain that Jesus had from just being raised by his Joseph, different Joseph, by Mary, by his family, by his friends, uh, in the synagogues during those silent years, right? That might have been what his exile looked like. What did he gain from there? What did he gain from his uh, loneliness and his lack and his opposition of every level when he was in the wilderness for 40 days, symbolizing Israel's exile? What did he gain from his particular pit of when conspiracy led to criminal injustice, which led ultimately to his being lynched? Right? How was he carried in all of those expressions and experiences of pit? The book of Hebrews tells us it was for the joy that was set before him. It was for the vision that he was always moving towards. And so as you come to the table today, there is a table for forgiveness here, which is God, forgive me, forgive us if we thought we're a somebody without you behind us. But also, Lord God, forgive me, forgive us if we have thought we're a nobody that doesn't have you behind us. And then, Lord, at this table, make us not a somebody or a nobody, make us your body for you, for ourselves, and for the needs and stakes that are around us. Come to the table when you are ready. Let me pray. Father, would you please uh, thank you, first of all, Lord, for answering prayers. Uh, would you please uh, guide us to this place where we can honestly reflect on the past experiences that we had and what they've given us, good, bad, or ugly, and to recognize that you've put us in places, you've given us skills and insights and character all through your Holy Spirit and all because of Jesus that we ought to step forward with. When the time is right, Lord, may we not uh, abandon the call that you've given us, yes, to be trustworthy citizens, but also to be responsive leaders. So give us your spirit um, to those ends. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come when you are ready.